My guest today on the podcast is a lauded portrait and editorial photographer. Uh, she was originally born in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, but is now based in Washington, D.C. Uh, she's a member of the board of directors of Focus on the Story, the immediate past president of the Women Photojournalists of Washington. Uh, she is also the co-chair of photography at the National Press Club and Adobe Education Leader and an adjunct professor at her alma mater, Howard University. Uh, Sharice May is often commissioned to speak about inclusive storytelling. Uh, she trains and speaks to organizations and educators around the world, including Spotify, uh, Adobe, Leica, the Financial Times, uh, the Center for Creative Photography, and the International Center of Photography. Uh, Cerise has been uh, published in the New York Times, O Magazine, the White House website, People Magazine, the San Francisco Chronicle, ABC News, the Today Show, and other international publications. Uh, she has a traveling exhibit and forthcoming book called Cerise May Soul Connection. And she has images in the social justice campaign called Content for Change with BET. Her work is in the permanent collection of the African American Museum in Philadelphia and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem, New York. And let me tell you, if I had any imposter syndrome, it would be tingling right now because I'm like, oh, my God, how she got time to talk to us? But she does. Welcome to the podcast, Sharice May. Thank you, Sharice. How are you? I'm great, Ricky. Thank you for having me. Like, listening to you read that feels like, man, like, when do I sleep? Like, what What else <laughs> What else am I doing? But it's, you know, over time, um, things, you know, just kind of fell, fell together. I'm actually on sabbatical right now from uh, teaching at Howard because of so many of the other things that I'm doing. I just didn't have the time to dedicate. And I had been teaching as an adjunct for 18 years. So I, I think I was due a little bit of a a step away time, um, you know, from teaching. You definitely do some time away, some time <laughs> to focus on you. I also, you know, I know I was raised well, so I'm not going to ask a woman her age, but I'm having a hard time dealing with this teaching for 18 years, oh, yeah. which means you are like, wait, what? <laughs> Good black no crack. I mean, this sister's talented. She's right. smart. She's all those things, but you're also beautiful. I just want to. No, I appreciate out. you. Um, so Cherise, let, let's just dive in. I, you know, as I, I prepare for these things by reading and, and researching and stuff, of course. And I came across something that I did not know that we are both born in Missouri, me in St. Louis, uh -huh. but you in Kansas city, right. uh, <laughs> Missourians, both of us. Uh, yeah. although I technically, I mean, I grew up in LA. I moved to LA when I was a baby. Yeah, so but you were born I, in Missouri. I don't know, but I was born in St. Louis. Okay. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how that Midwestern upbringing kind of impacted your development as, as a person, as a woman of color, as an oh, artist. Sure. Um, it, so Kansas City, as you know, um, you know, the Midwest is conservative. And um, so I grew up, well, I first grew up in a neighborhood that was predominantly black. And when I was about nine years old, uh, my family moved to a suburb um, of Kansas City called Lee Summit, Lee's Summit, Missouri. And when I moved there, we were actually the only black family on my street. Oh, wow. And it wasn't a short street. So that just goes to show you, I went from, you know, my neighborhood that was predominantly black to being the only black family on the street. And then my cousin lived on the other, other, other side of the development where we were. So it was when you moved? pretty much of a culture shock. You said what? How, how old were you when you moved? It's about nine years old. Okay. So that's a significant culture shock for you. Nine it, year old. It, it is, it is. And it was, you know, I've, I've told this story before. It was the first time I was called the N word too. Um, and this was like riding home on the on the bus, on the school bus with my brother and being the only black kids on the bus and, you know, hearing the N word and monkeys and, you know, all that, all that stuff. So that was like my first introduction to that going from, you know, hey, I'm like, there's several families like that look like me and this never came up to, you know, being transported to a neighborhood where now we're the only one and, you know, the lights are shining on us and, you know, you have all this kind of hate thrown at you. So 
that was like the start. And I think with that, I think my parents did a good job in with my brother and I instilling in us like to not not let those things stop you and to actually use that as fuel to to do even more to do more, to do more than what they expected us to do yeah. and to not give up and to just keep going. And I think that probably has helped me in, cause you get more no's than yeses in life. It's just how things go. But to me, it's, it's what you do with those no's and it's not staying down, but continuing to press forward especially if you're doing something that you love, that you're passionate about. And for me, storytelling, using my camera is what I'm passionate about. But it's not only my passion, I know that it's my purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's what the difference is. And that's what keeps me moving forward. That in addition to my support, my support network, my family, my friends, um, my Howard family, you know, all of that helps to, um, you know, keep me going. Yeah. You mentioned something very profound that not only is it your passion, but it's your purpose. When did you realize, when did you have language for it being your purpose in life? Right. How did that come to fruition for you? And that did not happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and actually I started out as a graphic designer and it was probably about 10 years ago that I like really came into that and felt that and knew that and knew that it was true. Um, there's something about realizing your purpose that it just, it like opens, opens the door and your, you know, the film comes off of your eyes and you're like, oh, wow. Like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, and I had never felt that before. You know, I thought that, um, you know, I was really into like graphic design. I did a little bit of drawing and things like that. And I, I always knew in my heart that I was going to do something creative. I just didn't know what that would be. I thought it was going to be in graphic design. I thought that I was going to be creating, you know, through that um, avenue. But I ended up, um, I worked for some newspapers over the years. Um, I was at the Washington Post. Um, I was at the military newspaper, Stars and Stripes. I just kind of made my way around and I would do the, the graphics uh, for the newspaper. So anything you would see like from any kind of graphical representation, whether it's like a little drawing or there's some kind of graphic to um, visualize data um, and also to lay out the pages. So when you get the paper and how it's, you know, where's the photo place, what photo is used and how everything flows. I was, you know, part of that, that team of people that would, would do that. And so it was interesting because my, I was like all in, like, I thought like, this is it. Like, I love this. And then at some point, Ricky, um, I, I lost that feeling. Like, I was like, this is not it. And I realized like I started to spend money and, you know, the money I would make, I'm just like spending it. I was traveling all the time. And not that there's nothing, you know, I think you should travel and things like that. Absolutely. But I feel like I was searching for my purpose. And so I would do things to try to like, because in that, I think you you find happiness. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't happy in what I was doing at the time. I was like, man, I used to love this, but now I'm dragging myself in, you know, I'm I don't really, I don't find the fulfillment. I don't find that joy anymore. <clears throat> so, but I, I was kind of on this track of, I don't want to be the starving artist either. Like, I like having nice things. I like being able to travel. I like, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, that starving artist thing. Ain't nothing romantic about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I already been down that road with school, you know, sleeping on the floor and, you know eating ramen noodles. And I was like, I don't want to go back to that. I really don't want to go back to that. So I was um, kind of in this cycle of, you know, going into work, but not really like not my heart, not being in it mm -hmm. and blessing in disguise, I got laid off. And so in my layoff, this was like that, that kick out of the, the nest, that kick in the pants that I needed. 
to actually fulfill my purpose. Yeah. And I think to me that it was divine because I probably would have just kept going in this career in something that I used to love, but it wasn't my purpose. And there's a difference. I think there's a difference in, in working and having a job and actually doing something that is within your purpose. It just, it makes all the difference. And it's a feeling that I didn't, I couldn't explain until I felt it. Yeah. And then like a weight was released from my shoulders and I'm like, oh man, like, I feel like I'm living life, you know, finally like mm-hmm. this, wow, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, people think about it and, and talk about wanting to be happy and, and happiness is a wonderful thing. But for me, the definition of happiness is something, you know, it comes from things outside of you, right? You're happy when you're in a great relationship. You're happy when you have money, you're happy after you have a good meal, but happiness is always tied to these things outside of yourself. And therefore it's fleeting and temporary the same way those things are. But exactly. joy emerges from knowing deeply inside who you are, whose you are, what you're connected to and what your, what your purpose is, why, why you're here. For some people, it's to be a parent and to raise wonderful children in the world. For others, it's to be a business person or whatever. But for us, it's, it's to be an artist. And when you recognize that and you can walk in the authenticity of who you are and embrace that, I think you're right. You know, it does. It feels a void inside you. It removes mm-hmm. that. I love that analogy of removing that film from your eyes and you can see mm-hmm. the world clearly and, and, and brightly. And it, it's a blessing to be able to do that. And that's one of the reasons I do the work that I do. I like mm-hmm. I want to give people the keys to start to understand the importance of that and the keys and the tools to get to that space. Uh, because I think society in general benefits from people being who they're supposed to be, living as they're supposed to live and, and walking in their purpose. I'm so glad you shared that story. It's fascinating to understand. How if I could um, tie it to a movie, it's most like the matrix, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, before I'm, I'm going through the motions, you know, I'm doing something. That I think like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, this is success. You know, I'm doing well in my career. You know, I have money. I can buy things. I can do things. Um, I thought like, this is it, you know, and I'm, I'm in this like cycle until like, it just hit me one day, like, this is not it. Like, I'm not, I'm not feeling this anymore. Something has to give. Yeah. You're, now your mom was instrumental in your journey to photography as well. Tell me a little bit about that. Cause that's interesting to me. How she yeah. Worked. So my mom was, um, she's a retired um, school teacher and she taught high school in Kansas city. She was a business school teacher and also the advisor to the yearbook at the school. And so she bought this camera. She um, bought this film camera and she brought it home. And I'm, the, you know, a little girl, like, this is like some new toy coming in. Like, Ooh, what is this? This shiny object here. And so she showed it to me and I asked her, could I see it? Could I play with it? And she let me, she would let me take the camera. And I started playing with it and showing up at family events, taking pictures and, you know, dropping my film off to get developed and just happy to, you know, oh, can we go, you know, can you take me to go pick up my, my pictures and go picture, you know, pick them up after they were developed. And then the next family event, you know, I'm, I'm laying out a, a cloth on the table, a tablecloth, making it all nice. And then I'm laying the photos out so that when the family come in, they come into the dining room or wherever, and they're looking through the pictures pointing, oh, look at you. Oh, and, you know, I, I don't know how good those photos were at that time. You know, I enjoyed it. I had fun. But you would think, like, the way my family poured into me that it was, like, the greatest ever. Like, my photos were just so amazing. And to me, that is, like, a start of when you're pouring into a child like that, then it just kind of makes you feel more confident about, you know, what you're doing and, oh, like, I can not only have fun, but, um, you know, I enjoy doing this, but actually like my family and people are telling me like, I'm good at it too. So mm-hmm. that, that goes a long way for a child in trying to figure life out and, you know, your purpose and, you know, little did I know that that was pouring into my purpose way back then. I just, you know, and I think everything happens for a reason and it's, things are, you know, it's purposeful. And I was meant to go the path and 
walk that path that I did. And it gave me great experience to realize my purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, graphic design actually goes hand in hand mm -hmm. with photography. And it actually, I still employed like some of those skills as a graphic designer in the work that I do with my camera. So, yeah, I was going to say, you know, too, the other thing I think your family did, and obviously they love you and they're pouring into you, but um, I don't know if those were all empty com comments or compliments, you know, like ph photography is a way of showing people themselves and the world they inhabit and it brings mm -hmm. something else out in people. So I think you also were experiencing the impact of image making Mm -hmm. on people that you love and there's something about that power that you have as an image maker uh that can be intoxicating too now like any other power it can be misused or it can be used yeah. for good but it absolutely uh showed you some insights into that i suspect as well um who are some of the photographers that influenced you by the way you have any photographers that really kind of influence you oh for sure um i have some contemporaries and i have some people like you know who are ancestors now and things like that um of course, Gordon Parks. Um, the thing I'll say about Gordon Parks is I loved how he was able to go into communities and places and spaces that he was not really meant to go, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. Um, <clears throat> you know, to see him, some of his uh, work where he went to rural America and he would be at the kitchen table with some of these rural white families, yeah. you know, as, and they allowed him in their their personal space with their families, their kids, um, in their home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if they had ever done that before, but I suspect that that was new for some of them. But apparently he had a way to communicate and connect that they felt comfortable to invite him in to their space. And that's, that's one thing I really um, appreciate about him, especially in my journey um, as an image maker, uh, storyteller, I, I'm in spaces and I've been in spaces where I'm the only uh, woman of color, sometimes the only woman, um, sometimes the only one of color, not just a woman of color. So <clears throat> to me, it's like, I think about not only him that, but those who, you know, were before me that were able to like do that work and to tell those stories and to go beyond any kind of like limitations and restrictions that may have been presented um, to them. Um, I'm a big fan of your work for sure. Thank you. Um, Layla Amatula Baran. Um, out of New York, mm -hmm. um, there work. is um, there's a group of photographers that we all were on the uh, podcast for Black Shutter, and um, Idris Solomon. Um, God, there's so many D Dwyer here in DC. Mm -hmm. um, what I really appreciate, Ricky, with um, those who photographers that inspire me mm -hmm. and I look at their work is those who are able to, to make these genuine authentic connections yeah. because you can really, the end result is it's not just a photo. You see the story, you mm -hmm. feel the story when you look at the image and you know that there was care taken into connecting to that image. You know that there was humanity, um, you know, within that. And you can see that, you can feel it versus, you know, someone may be a technically sound photographer, but you just don't feel anything. Yeah. It's technically like perfect. You know, everything is right. The lighting, the composition, everything, but it's something missing. And I think that's that connection. Um, I, I would be remiss. What'd you say? You're, no, I said, I'm sorry to cut you off. I agree with you. And I think that, and you're being humble, but that's really, for me, what brings your work to life. That you, Gordon Parks, Jamel Shabazz, you all have this shared respect for, reverence for, and shared humanity with the people that you shoot. And it comes out in the images. That's really, I think, the, di the difference in so many people's work. You either, you know, you look at people as a subject, 
and mm-hmm. you're posing them and you're looking at them with your gaze and you're putting your thing all over it, or you allow people's humanity to unfold in front of you. And you do that brilliantly. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because I think at your, at your core, you're obviously a storyteller and, and a humanist. And that for me is what powers your work, what brings your work to life. Um, and, and I, I appreciate your humility, but that's what you, I appreciate you for brilliant at that. I mean, that's my goal is to not put my own kind of notions on anyone or, you know, what I may think something is or who someone is. I want their authentic self to be represented. I want you to see who they truly are, their voice and what they're about. Um, in the list of people, too, I, I must make sure to um, say Fred Watkins. Uh, Fred was long time with Ebony and Jet. Um, he was a mentee of Gordon Parks, um, and he pour, he has poured a lot and still pours a lot into me. Like he checks on me, you know. I talked to him yesterday. He called me the other day. How's it going? How are you doing? And he's one of the ones that told me like so within those spaces that were all like this was all very new to me. He said, um, "Don't let anybody push you around. You're there." to do a job, you're there to do something, you do that job and you just, you, you hold your position. And I'll never, you know, forget him saying that to me. And, you know, I'll replay that in my head sometimes if I'm in a situation where it's a little rough um, in terms of what's going on. Um, if you have like a, um, like a press pool where there are several photographers and people are jockeying for position and, yeah. you know, things like that, you know, that comes to my mind too. Like, Hey, like I'm here to do a job too. I have done limited time in those situations. And I got to <laughs> tell you, y'all got that. Y'all can have that. <laughs> Kudos to each of and every one of you who do it. Thank you for doing it. Not my gig. Yeah. <laughs> so. And it's it's amazing and it's impressive to see the quality of work that you create being in those settings. For me, understanding what those settings can be like sometimes. Yeah. What is it in yourself that you call on to navigate those spaces when you're in them? What is it that you call on within yourself to navigate being the only person of color in the room, being the only sister in the room, being the only woman in the room quite often? Where, where does that strength come from? Where does that perseverance and that excellence come from? Yeah. So first of all, I have to say, like, this is from family, you know, it's how I was raised. Um, That's that's the core. That's the base. And then I'm also spiritual and I believe in God. I believe in prayer and I will start in my day the same. And that's in prayer. And in my prayer, I ask for direction. Um, Please let me see things clearly and please let me connect to and see what I need to and what I should be seeing and connecting to. And for me, that just, that's like the, the base. And that is my start to just being super aware. And that's what it's about, especially in, um, in the news settings Mm -hmm. there, you know, sometimes there's so much going on. It's like, what do you focus on? Right. You know, Sometimes there's not really anything going on. What do you focus on? So for me, um, having that start, having that end um, is my way to open myself to connect to what I should be connecting to. And and that's my prayer like that uh, for safety, you know, because in some of those situations I'm in, you know, positions and spaces where um, security and safety is, um, important, you know, it's, some of them are like life, <laughs> life situations where it can go, you know, really I'm bad. Brought, I'm glad you brought that up because I know that you have, um, first of all, you follow president Trump and, and shot him, uh, on more than one occasion. And you also, and this was shocking to me, you were in the Capitol on January 6th. That's a perfect example of, of spirit having to protect you. Tell me a little bit about what that experience was like, what you were doing before and, and, and how you navigated that, that moment. Yeah, I still, um, you know, I can still remember that day so clearly, but, um, you know, I had, um, I had been to the Capitol several times, you mm-hmm. know, to, to work and do things and 
that was like the last thing that I would think could ever happen, you know, January 6th, like that would never happen. Um, you know, when I, when I would go in there, so put it this way. Um, <clears throat> so I do a range of things, you know, from portraits to news to, you know, some things in between. And if I was, so say like, um, at the height of the murder of George Floyd, when you had all the uprisings all over and I, I covered some of those things and I was out, you know, on the streets, uh, Washington, DC. And there's a way that I, my awareness and how I moved was different than my awareness and how I moved inside the Capitol. Because inside the Capitol was a protected space. Right. You know, you have all these Capitol Police, you have to go through security, get everything scanned. You have to have, you know, you have this identification that is, you know, locked in. So, you know, nobody could just go in there, you know, without any kind of clearance or, you know, anything like that. So when I would go inside of there, once I passed security, it's like my guard was down, you know, it wasn't that, <clears throat> you know, like when I was out covering uprisings, you know, my head is on a swivel. When mm -hmm. I came into the Capitol, it just kind of, all of that just kind of went out the window and I'm like feeling safe and protected. Right. It was a false sense of, you know, security, obviously, because January 6th just like flipped that all the way around. And, um, it started out like it normally does, um, you know, very quiet. And especially like during that time, it was the ceremonial vote count. And so it was a bit ceremonial. You know, there are certain things that happens every time and you just kind of follow the ceremony and everything was just kind of like clockwork. Um, but that particular day and, you know, that in that year was different than any other you know, vote count in the past. Um, that was my first time um, doing that, covering that. So I didn't know like what to expect, but I never expected what happened on January 6th to happen. So it it was a very quiet day. Um, I have family and friends who were sending me messages of encouragement and saying, I'm praying for you, be careful. And I was like, I remember saying, oh, I'll be fine. Like, I'm not going to be outside, I'm inside. Right. I'm good. That, yeah. That, that illusion I said, nothing of safety. Happens. Yeah. Nothing have, ever happens inside the Capitol. I'm good. Like, I, I can remember even my dad calling me, like, right before it started, like, getting not good and saying, where are you? Because it's looking crazy out there. I was like, I'm inside. Like, so I'm not going out there. So I'm good. He was like, okay, well, be careful. Tell and not about, you know, sooner, you know. Tell me about that moment when you realize, when you guys found out things are not as they should be, what was that moment? Like, what were you doing? How did you find out? And what was that initial emotion you felt? Yeah. Um, it was chaos like quickly. Um, and it, it went from like zero to a hundred and felt like seconds because everything was normal. It was quiet. I had my laptop out and I'm filing photos to send, um, you know, send in. And I start hearing like this commotion below because I was in the balcony overlooking Statuary Hall. Mm -hmm. I hear this commotion below and I get up and I, I look over the balcony. And that's when I saw Capitol Police scrambling and putting bike racks up to um, block the, the hallway that leads to the house chamber. Um, and I was like, okay, I've never seen that in all the times I've been here, like something's not right. And then, you know, I hear they start getting on the radios and I see one of them draw a gun. And so at that moment I was like, okay. And I think it was in part of that, it was probably the adrenaline mm -hmm. and everything. Like, I just, I don't feel, I didn't feel anything in terms of like, Oh my God. Like I wasn't freaking out or anything. It was just kind of real calm. Like I remember, and there was an office door that was open that's connected to that balcony. And I knock on the door. There, there was like a lady um, sitting in there 
And um, she invited me into her office and her window looked out on the lawn where you could see the Washington Monument and it's where the inauguration was going to take place. So we mm -hmm. could see the platform and the media platform and tower and people were on there and they were like rocking it, like tearing it apart. And all I remember is seeing like, <clears throat> we would hear these big, like, it sounded like a cannon. And I guess they were like flashbangs. Mm -hmm. And we would hear the boom, like a cannon. And then we would see smoke and then people were waving these big Trump flags. And so um, she was like, I think it, people were like in shock. Cause I remember saying, um, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get to my car. <laughs> you know, that was the, the first thing that she said that came out. Like that was an understatement of the year. Car. And I was like, yeah, I don't think so. And she's like, I should have parked somewhere else. That was the, you know, I think it was like, you know, that kind of like I, disbelief. Um, yeah. And it, that was like one of the longest days because I actually went in early because I wanted to kind of document what it looked like before everything got started. And I remember taking like earlier in that day before everything got started inside the Capitol, um, I went outside and I was behind, there were um, bike racks set up, there were Capitol Police and I was behind the line of police at first and I stepped in front of them to get close to the bike racks because there were people that were kind of moving around back there. Um, some of them had signs, they were protesting, but it was just like kind of, it was real quiet and people were just kind of walking through, just walking through on their way to the ellipse where the rally was taking place. Yeah. And um, I just remember like I'm taking some photos and I look over and I see these two, um, these two men, these two white men one had on a U.S. Marines ball cap. I see them over there kind of talking, just the two of them. And I turn my camera towards them, pointing my lens to take the picture. I just remember they stopped talking. And the one man with the ball cap, he just like stared through me. It was like this piercing stare that it like he wasn't looking <laughs> at me. It was like looking through me. And that like shook me. Like I got goosebumps, I got chills. And I said, I'm going back inside. And I went back inside the building and little did I know, like all of that that was happening outside would actually, you know, come inside. Come inside. I mean, it's safe to say that's something that never happened to you, never happened to the country. And uh, I'm sure it has a lasting impact on, on you and, and how you do your work, uh, particularly as a photojournalist. Um, has it affected how you, how you move in these spaces? Has it affected oh, sure. how you shoot events? What's, yeah. what's been I, to be honest with you, like the same comfort level I would have in places that are quote unquote, highly secured, or, you, you know, you have to have credentials and things like that. Mm -hmm. My head is on a swivel there now too. Yeah. You know, whereas before, like my guard was down and, you know, go about my business. Like now. I find myself being super aware of noises, movements, like I'm looking like anything that seems off or, you know, just doesn't feel like sit right. And I also try to be aware of where I'm positioned and is there out? Is there somewhere where I can get out and that I'm not, you know, trapped it somewhere? Um, and that has changed because I never really thought like that in certain places that were secured, but now it's, um, it's definitely presence of mind for me. That's one of the most, uh, I think insidious things about this moment that we're in. And instead of looking at each other as human beings, as fellow citizens, uh, as, as fellow Americans, we have to really look at each other. As, are you a friend or a foe? Are you yeah. here to, partnership and, and, and existing brotherhood and sisterhood with me, or are you uh, an enemy uh, meant to cause me harm? Even in these places that are quote unquote secure, are the people who are in charge of securing the place 
on the side of freedom and democracy or they uh, have other nefarious goals. That's really uh, unfortunate and tragic. Uh, but I do believe that we can find our way back from, from this moment in the elections uh, this past Tuesday are an indication that the American people aren't quite as far gone as we'd like to believe uh, that we are, that there is some, there's some hope there. Um, but the images of that day are, are, are burned into our, all of our hearts and oh, our yeah. minds for, for a very long time. You know, yeah, it's amazing. I can, I was able to talk to you about that without getting emotional because for the longest time, um, I would get emotional when I, when I talked about it mm -hmm. and it just, you know, I can sit here and I can still remember it, um, and everything in that, but it's, I'm able to kind of talk about it with um, a little less of like going yeah. into that place. It, it's a traumatic experience without a doubt. And, and traumatic experiences take time to heal from. I mean, the theme of the podcast this season is hope, healing and, and love and the need for all three of those in our lives. And you just spoke to a very traumatic moment that I think you and so many of us all have to still heal from whether you were there in the space or whether you were watching on TV or whether your sense of, of safety and security and, and the system that we uh, exist in, um, you're just not going to look at it different. You're going to look at it differently going forward. And that is something that that's a wound. It's a deep wound and it's a wound that we all have to find our way back from and heal from. And that's why it's so insidious that anybody I would even deny that it happened because denial present, prevents you from moving to a space of healing. And that's so much, I think, of what's wrong in this country. We deny our past. We deny the truth of what we've been and who we are. And until we do that, we can't deal with the wounds that we've inflicted on ourselves and in each other uh, in the process. Sharice, you know, I, the images of the day, like I said, are burned in our mind, but imagery in general, we just live in, in this age of images, right? We, from Instagram to magazines, to television and film, we are bombarded uh, by images. And we, we all know images are powerful and, and impactful uh, in ways that words can rarely be, right? Um, but I'm curious, uh, how does photography, uh, in your estimation, how does photography continue to hold space for truth and for inspiration when we're inundated with images all day? So many of them, not to be judgmental, but so many of them not so great. They're not so empowering. How does photography continue to hold space for, for truth and for inspiration uh, in this climate? Yeah, I think um, it all depends on um, who is making that image mm -hmm. and what their intention is. Um, it, that's one thing I talk about, too, is being intentional when you do this work. Like, what is your intention? Is your intention to, to show truth? to shine light on that truth or is your intention to um, gaslight or, you know, show people or a community in a way that, you know, is prejudging. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, as long as we have image makers, storytellers who want to be authentic and want to show those real moments in, in the purest um, of forms and not to put our own notions um, in play, you know, into that, then I think we'll be fine. I think that counters like all the other, mm -hmm. as long as you have had that, because, you know, those images are gonna, they're gonna live you know, on and on and on beyond, you know, even our lifetime. And um, it it's important that we do have um, people who want to tell the truth, who want to be authentic uh, out there doing the work. And that's one thing I really appreciate with photographers that, you know, I respect and I admire and that are inspirations to me is that they do that work. and. It is work. It is absolutely there's a, work. There's a lot that goes into that. And you also, you also take in a lot. And sometimes you're taking in things that can weigh you down if you don't release. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's another thing in terms of like mental health for us is like, you really have to take that time for you. 
Yeah. You know, because we can get so consumed and wrapped up into doing the work that we don't give selves and give time and space to ourselves. I'm so yeah. glad you you spoke to that because that is very, very true, particularly for those of us who are doing portrait work and mm -hmm. trying to capture people uh, as authentically as possible. You know, you're going to spend a lot of time before and after you click that shutter with that person getting into their life, getting into their story, understanding their journey. And a lot of us tend to be empaths, right? And mm -hmm. you know, if I'm shooting a, a trans or an LGBTQ person who's uh, experienced some trauma, I'm going to know a lot about that story and about that trauma quite often. Unfortunately, I may have even shared some of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't jettison that the minute you click that shutter. That lives with you. And sometimes when you see the picture, it, it brings it back to you. Jamel Shabazz talks about you know, people he shot on his street photography work and then finds out when he runs into people later on that that person passed away or they're in prison or they met a, a, a horrific end. And it's a lot on us. And I'm a big advocate for therapy for this reason that I think yeah, we all yeah. need to work through these things uh, consistently and not just wait till it's a crisis, but really just get help and, and be able to work through these things in real time to keep yourself uh, as healthy as possible. And shout out to Jamel because... He does a lot of important work and he's one of the ones that, in, that I respect and, and inspires me. Um, <clears throat> but the way he has documented um, his community, mm -hmm. and that's what I talk about a lot too, is <clears throat> to tell your story. Like yeah. those things that are happening right in your community, in your family, you know, right around you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's done that for years and he's been this documentarian um, and I just love, you know, seeing when he, he brings these out and he shares it. I'm like, oh man, like he has been in it, you know, for a while now and he's doing incredible work and great work. And I love when he shares stories where he'll bring back an image he took like in the eighties and it was like a small child in the picture and now they're an adult mm -hmm. and he presents them, you know, with this photo of them, you know, back then and how much of an impact it makes to them or how maybe their parent is no longer living. And he presents this, this print to them, this photo that shows their mom or their dad who's no longer here and how that, that touches and impacts them. So yeah. it's, it's really important work. It, it really is. And you mentioned the personal as well, right? Not just the community, but just literally the personal. And Latoya Ruby Frazier comes to yes. mind. We were in a group show together and, you know, her work just really literally focused, laser focused on her own family and what the industrial town that they live in has done to families like hers over the years. Mm -hmm. It's powerful, powerful mm -hmm. work. And so literally just looking around you in your house, in your family, in your community, those are the stories that are, are waiting to be told. Uh, and for those of us, you know, people of color and, and quote unquote marginalized groups, those stories are often not told. So it's really important and vital that those stories are told. But I'm curious, Cherise, we've talked around it. And we've talked about Im images and we talked about your work, but what is it that you specifically try to capture in an image? Let's just distill that to a, a sentence. What is it? Hmm, you try to capture? That's a great question too. Um, to me, it depends on who it is. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to, I love to connect to people in their passion and when they're, they're doing their passion, when they're in the midst of that purpose. Um, to me, that is like the, the closest connection to the soul of who that person is. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to once I feel like I've made that connection to the soul, my goal is to, in an image, um, be able to share that with others and that they be able to, to feel that story or to see that story or that connection, you know, that was there. And I'll bring up again, like my, my background as a graphic designer, uh, one thing that I didn't notice I was doing it, but, um, it was kind of like a subconscious intentional thing I was doing, but um, I tend to use negative space a lot when I'm doing my portraits and. Brilliant it, use of negative space. Thank you. To me, that was like my, my graphic design, but then 
where the photography kicked in is I feel like it leaves space for people to make a connection, you know, with them. So I, you know, thought that in my head and I never, I never verbalized that, you know, to people. And so when I had this exhibit, um, I had um, my first, my first exhibit for Sharice May Soul Connection was at the um, Leica store in LA. And so um, a woman, Dara, her name is Dara. Uh, I know her now. Uh, she came up to me and she said, I love how you use negative space. I feel like I'm right there having a conversation, you know, with them. And so she verbalized what I hadn't verbalized, but, you know, what I was thinking and my intention in what I was doing, you know, in that. She's like, I stand there and I look at it and I feel like I'm right there. That's a great segue to something I want to do. So we uh, have launched a YouTube version of this podcast and those who are watching the YouTube will be able to uh, participate in what I'm about to do uh, most directly. Those, the rest of you listening to audio, you can just listen to the descriptions, but I want to mention two or three. We'll, we'll see what we have time for a couple of your images. And I want you to unpack that image for me a little bit. Um, they are among my favorite images and apparently they're some of the ones you like the most as well, because you shared them with us. Uh, let's start with your neighbor in college, Chadwick Boseman. Mm. Talking about use of negative space, there's a portrait you shot of him that is absolutely gorgeous. Tell me a little bit about that image, how it came together, and what that image means to you. Yeah, and I have to say, I saw Black Panther 2 last night, and shout out to Ryan Coogler and the cast and everyone involved with that movie, because they really, it was a nice dedication to Chad um, in that movie. They I think they did a, a great job in in honoring his legacy. So I absolutely I agree with you. It was a beautiful um, memorial for him, celebration of Black women and sisterhood. And and Ryan Coogler really just shout out to him. I know filmmaking is a incredibly collaborative process, and and when you make a film that big, it's a huge undertaking. Uh, but he clearly is a master storyteller. He clearly is somebody who's passionate about us, our stories and our place in the world and weaving our stories into the wider tapestry of American, American society and, and, and world history. And he just does it. It almost feels effortless when he, he does it. And we're mm -hmm. hoping to get him on the podcast sometime soon to talk about that. But I agree. I share, I share your sentiments, but back to you. Yeah. Your beautiful so, image, Chadwick. So, <clears throat> At that time, little did I know, little did everyone, you know, I'm not going to say everyone, but majority of us in the public, you know, his family, I'm sure knew that he was actually had cancer at that time. And it's like he never, he never showed that that was going on in his life. Like he continued to to work in his purpose. He continued to do what he was passionate about. And um, the particular photo I think you're speaking about is um, it's a very quiet, reflective um, moment. And knowing now what I didn't know then, I can go back and kind of look at that and, and think like, man, he must have really been thinking about the weight of all that he was going through, but yet how much he wanted to keep pushing forward. And he didn't want people to feel sorry for him. He didn't want to, you know, the opportunities to stop for him to continue doing that, that he was purposed to do. Um, so it was like really reflective, introspective and um, almost like I, I look at it and I think about, Maybe he's thinking about the weight of all of that and, you know, just taking that breath, taking a moment to just take a deep breath and exhale. Yeah. Um, it, I saw all those things, but there also is this, this quiet strength mm. in the image. He is determined to live every breath with mm -hmm. dignity. He's focused, his eyes on the prize, 
he's introspective clearly there's 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 a gravitas in that picture mm-hmm. that you, you you can't miss for sure but there's it looks like a man who's made peace with his destiny and mm. is focused on the end goal. Yeah. I, you know, we are more than likely reading more into it than may have been there, but that's what, it, mm-hmm. that's just what emerges from it. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's beautifully shot. It's, it's well lit. It's all the Thank things. You. Uh, Thank and you. I just, I'm really, and we're sharing it on the visual version of the podcast so people can see it. Thank you. You're very welcome. The second image uh, is, just as strong in a very different kind of way. Uh, and actually there are two of them that uh, they, I want to uplift. One is called homecoming and it's in the yeah. group show Ben scene that we, you and I are in together currently at the Schomburg mm-hmm. center up here in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I view as a companion image to that, which is the flag girls on the field. Mm-hmm. And those two images say so much to me about our culture as African-Americans, HBCU culture, mm-hmm. youth, our creativity, our strength, all those things. Tell me about, uh, first of all, homecoming. What was going on when you shot that picture and what that picture means to you? Because it's another powerful image. So this is the one you with the dance, with the, yeah, the, the guy who's dancing. So, yeah, uh, HBCUs are something special. And uh, we were talking a little bit about it earlier. Um, I'm a, a proud uh, Howard alum, and we had our homecoming a couple weeks ago. And uh, our homecomings are like family reunions. So less of the kind of like real structured homecoming, but more of if you go to a family reunion and, you know, you're at the cookout, like, hey, cousin, you know, cousin Pete, you know, whatever. And everybody is like, you know, you see someone across across the yard and you're, you're running to each other and, you know, embracing in this, this, this hug that just brings you in. And it's just so much joy, so much love. And unadulterated black joy, boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. It's it's so much joy. And that photo to me, like, it was just so much joy there. And when I look at it, I even think about which I didn't see this until after, like when I printed it. Mm-hmm. But how you can really see the movement in that photo because his chain that he had on was like the motion was suspended where it's just frozen like in motion so it really speaks to like how much that he was he was dancing you know there was dancing going on Mm -hmm. focused um focused on that and then like all the hype around him like Everybody was like just showing this love, like get it, like uh, I can just, <laughs> I can just see myself like in that moment where you know there everybody is just surrounding him, and it was just giving him, giving him more energy and, and more to give on that. We say in the community, they were giving him life, and he oh, was giving them the same him. thing in return. Yeah, and he was giving it back. Yeah, it was, it was that, and that you know that's the thing when you talk about. Um, you know, black people and the culture, HBCUs, is it's that whole like call and response. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so that's a lot that was that I felt, um, you know, when I was in that moment and, um, you know, I saw saw that photo. It was that, that call and response in that, you know, given, you know, we're going to give you and then you give us. And it's just all this joy wrapped around that. So it. I could, uh, it, it was really electric that moment actually. And, um, you know, it it's making me smile. It's making me smile now. You, you see know, this face, about- like every time I see the picture, I feel the same energy. And yeah. I mean, the brother's face, he was so serious he yeah, he was in it, intense. but everybody around them is receiving that passion yeah. and it's manifesting in them as joy. Yeah. So they're, they're smiling. They're just yeah. they're going up. They're into it. I mean, it was, it, it was black culture in a picture Yeah, the kind of companion piece in my mind is the, the flag girls on the field performing at halftime. Another yeah, uh, statement about who we are as a people in our culture. Uh, that was powerful as well. I mean, Sharice, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful work. Um, I, I messed up some good clothes for that photo too. <laughs> <laughs> I had, you know, homecoming, you come back, you get a fresh uh, sweatshirt, you know, for the game. That was the day of the game. You know, I had some new jeans on, probably some new sneakers, you know, just, just fresh. And uh, it had been raining. So 
the ground in the field was like wet and muddy. Yeah. There were still like some, you know, places where it's like water, you step and, you know, you stepping into water. But it it was one of those, one of those moments, one of those times where it's like, you know what? I'm gonna have to get muddy and I'm gonna have to mess up all these clothes. And I know like after the game, I'm going on the yard, everybody's gonna be on there. And I don't care because this, I felt like there was going to, it was going to be magic. Mm -hmm. And so I just knew like, you're going to have to lay down for this. You're going to have to get on that wet ground. And cause I wanted to, you know, a lot of times when you're in this moment, um, as a photographer, as a storyteller, you want people to feel what you felt in mm -hmm. that moment. And if it's something that is like the joy and the magic, you know, that goes on there. It's like, I wanted people to, to feel exactly how that moment felt. And so I knew that I had to just kind of throw all that stuff aside of what I had spent on, you know, my new sweatshirt and everything and the sneakers and just get on the ground, get dirty and be able to actually just kind of connect to that magic that was going to happen because I saw like how color, you know, the colors with the flags. And I mean, that was uh so that was North Carolina, a and golden delights, um, is dancing. And I mean, they came ready. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me go ahead and, uh, and do this. And it just to show you how, this is an example too of how there's no no period, there's no time stamp on on magic like that. Like yeah. maybe two years, two or three years after I had taken that photo, um, I got a call from O Magazine, and they were like, "We love this photo you took, you know, um, of the dancers on the field, and uh, we wanted to." Um, to license it for our fall edition. You know, we're going into a budget meeting, you know, it's all this. Cause at first I thought, Ricky, I thought like somebody was playing with me. <laughs> and so when I got the call, I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. As she's talking, I'm like, yeah, yeah. But then when she started, cause I worked for a publication before, mm -hmm. when she started using technical terms that aren't really like public layman's terms, okay. I was like, oh, wait a minute. Like, no, this is, yeah, she's saying the 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 words that I know. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is legit. And so they ended up licensing the photo. And um it was on it was like a double spread in the magazine. The photo ran across the two pages. But here's the thing, here's the thing too. Um, as a photojournalist, a lot of times when you're doing things, you get the information from the people that you're photographing. Right. Because it's going to go on publication. They want to know, hey, who is this person? You know, what's their name? What's their story? But the thing is with these, with something like that, I couldn't run out onto the field and be like, okay, so what's your name? And what's your name? And where are you from? Like if the moment happened, the magazine was there, bam. You know, I never knew if I would ever connect with any of them. Right. Like it was what it was. But when O Magazine called, they were like, do you have the contact information for any of the dancers? Cause we would love to interview them and, and put a little bit of story like with it. And so I was like, give me an hour. And I went into action, start making some calls, doing some stuff, was able to track down three of them, which were the main three in the photo. All right. And and was able to uh, interview them. And so they were able to put their names with it. And, you know, kind of a that ladies and gentlemen, that's the thing that black women do that <laughs> extra step right there. That's, that's what sisters do. I, I'm not going to, I, I would have probably considered doing it because I got a heavy dose of my grandmother and me, yeah. but most of us would have been like, I don't know. I'm sorry. It was two <laughs> years ago. It, you know, it is what it is. That's, it's, that's that extra mile of sisters. So. And I want I want to make sure that they got their shine yeah. and their glory from it because they had given so much to me, you know, with that photo that, you know, I was like, they need to be out there. You Absolutely. know, their story needs to be told. So let me, and I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> I went through some stuff 
to to get to it. It wasn't like some simple. I just picked up the phone one time. Hey, that's it. Like, yeah, I had to do some maneuvering it's a, it, movements. It's a journey, yeah. but it's it's an amazing picture. It's a gorgeous picture. Uh, it Thank speaks you. to the importance. You're very welcome. It speaks to the importance of gays because you're looking at it and seeing it and appreciating it and then sharing it with us in a way uh, that you couldn't if you weren't somebody from and and, and of that culture. I also think it's important, and I, I know what I like about the angle that you shot the picture. And not to get all technical. But I'm convinced that um, our ability to live life joyfully as as adults is directly connected to our ability to remain as childlike as possible and to see the world with childlike wonder, to experience things with childlike wonder. Children live in the moment and they experience the moment and then they're on to the next. They live in the moment. They may be upset, um, frustrated with you in the moment, but five minutes later, they're hugging you and they're kissing mm-hmm. you because they don't hold grudges. And they're looking up at things with this joyful, wondrous gaze. And so you being at that angle and looking up and capturing the colors and taking it all in, there's a childlike wonder in the quality that you captured from that moment. And I just, I just think it's critical that you, you know, see things that way and that the gaze of the photographer is something that people be need to be really mindful of. Sharice, this is like, I appreciate this conversation. It's been great so far. And I know there's a ton of people listening who love your work. I know there's a ton of people listening because I know my listeners, they're young creatives, creatives of color who are looking to either get into the business or to build their careers. What's some of the advice that you may have for young photographers or not even young, just emerging and new photographers who are trying to find their way into their craft as an artist, but then also the business ramifications of doing what we do. Well, first of all, I'll say it's a continual journey. Like it, you don't get to a certain point or a certain level um, and that's it. Like you can just sit back and rest and everything just keeps coming. Or it's, it's a continual, like I'm constantly learning. Um, I'm constantly finding new ways to, um, you know, to see things, uh, new ways to do things. And then staying up on um, technology and, you know, different things that I need to know so I could do the best um, with what I have. And um, community is very important. I'll definitely say that. And when I say community um, and speaking, you know, with this, if if anyone is interested in doing this work, is finding um, groups, finding people that will be your support network, that you can bounce ideas off of them, that you can share things with them before maybe you put it out there to the rest of the world and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or what if I do like, you know, this? Having having people or having someone that can be there for that is like critical. And also um, joining organizations and associations that will be support networks, uh, but that will also have resources um, that you need. Um, depending on what that is. It may be safety resources. It may be grants, um, access to money that will help fund, you know, these stories or projects um, that you want to do. And um, also they share opportunities for work, you know, commissions and different assignments, um, connecting with um, editors and creative directors So associations and groups are good for that. And um, I will also say, take advantage of um, portfolio reviews. Uh, Those are critical because it puts you across the table from uh, people who are responsible for um, hiring image makers, Um, people who, you know, whether they're editors or creative directors, um, you know, um, they're the ones that will make that call to say, hey, I have you know, I have the perfect, you know, portrait for you. Are you available for this? Or, you know, I'm working on this story. Do you want to work with us on this story? Um, That's important. Um, And then I will also say just to educate yourself and learn those things that you don't know, Um, you know, try to get stronger at those things where maybe it's not as easy or maybe challenging for you. And um, to just, if you employ those things and then, and 
the last thing I would say on that is to tell your story. And in telling your story, you're sharing your work. You're putting it out there so that people can see like, this is, this is what I see. You know, these are the stories that I'm telling. And, but if you don't share that, then, you know, no one will, will see them. No one will hear, you know, the story. So that's critical. And that's one of the things I would do with my students, students at Howard and any students, like if I do a workshop or anything is to try to encourage them to realize the power of their voice yeah. and the power of telling your story. So when I say tell your story, it's like there are things, as I said earlier, we spoke about earlier, there are things in your family, things in your community, things that are in your immediate surrounding, your neighborhood, Jamel Shabazz, like the work that he's doing. There are things there, there are stories there that no one can tell those better than you because that's your life. This is who you are. This is what is important to you. This is what you connect to. This is your community. So tell those stories. And then also to be able to share those stories of your community that maybe wouldn't be told unless, you know, there's got to be somebody to tell them. So it's also that, that purpose and that responsibility to do that. Absolutely. That's a great answer. And all true. I agree 100%. You know, we are in a group exhibition together at Schomburg Center called Ben Scene. It was curated by Novella Ford. Shout out to Novella. Shout out to Novella. We got to have her on the podcast soon as well. Um, I My last real big question for you is what is it about watching others experience the work that completes the work for you? Because I think that's an important addition to that final answer you just gave us there is yeah. sharing your work. What does it bring out in you to watch other people experience your work and how important is that to you? And that's a beautiful question. Um, it's critical, actually. Um, for me, I think... I think it's because you have certain, like there's certain things that I think about if I, you know, have, um, have a certain image and I knew like I was intentional in how I shot that image or, you know, what I went about or, you know, like I was saying with the, um, the dancer's photo, what I went through to, to get that photo, um, get that image. So, to have people to experience that, to, to see that, and then have a conversation with me about what they see in that, what they feel in that, how that connects with them and how it connects us like each other. Like I, I can, there's one, there's an image I have in um, my soul connection exhibit and it's, um, called sisterhood. And it's funny. And I don't know if I should say the names because I make people kind of guess who they are because the photo just shows like a detail of, of two women holding hands. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say their names because when you experience it, I want to see. Trust your instincts. Um, don't do so it. it's two women. It's a detail of them holding hands and you can see like they're gripping tightly. Like I got you. And when I um, when I showed that um, photo in the exhibit um, at the Leica exhibit, there were people that came up to me that were like, like all walks of life, like older white men, younger people, and the common thing was they all saw someone that they loved, a woman in their life that they loved, that it reminded them of. And they felt the comfort of that. They were like, it's like that support. It's like, you know, one older white guy said, you know, this, it reminds me of my grandmother and how she would just surround me, you know, with love and support. Like when I see that, that's what I feel. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing to, to be able to hear that feedback of, you know, things that you were very intentional in, in what you connected to, because a lot of times what I connect to are those quiet moments in the midst of noise. So it could be a lot going on. And with that particular um, image that I'm speaking of, there was a lot going on in this particular room. 
It was uh, before um, an awards event. And when I first entered the room and you have people racing back and forth, they're getting ready for this show, last minute things, you know, it's kind of like a production room. And I look across the room and I see these two sitting there in the midst of all of that, just quietly in sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And that like really like, like grabbed my heart. And then I, you know, just focused, focused on that because you know, I want people to be able to to experience that moment and to feel that. And in the midst of all of that, that there's some solace, there's some peace, there's some comfort. Um, so to me, connection is very important. So mm-hmm. to be able to be in a space where people are viewing viewing the work, viewing the images, and then be, being able to have that real-time feedback, that real-time conversation and connection is critical because, and it lets me know that I'm on going, I'm on the right track and what I'm doing is, is touching someone and that it's making some kind of connection or impact for them. And so for me, that pours into me to say, okay, Sharice, keep going, like keep Mm -hmm. doing it. This is well, your absolutely doing keep it. doing it, Sharice. Man. <laughs> Do it. You cannot stop. You're not allowed to stop. Sharice, please keep doing it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, sister. That is our responsibility as artists. We see differently. So our responsibility is to share what we see and how we see with others, because what you described uh, for me, I, I sum it up really briefly in that in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the stuff, stuff we create, the materialism, the capitalism, the politics, the entertainment, the show must go on, all that stuff. In the midst of all that, there's always humanity present. And our job is to capture humanity and reflect it back to people so that they can see themselves in that humanity. And once you embrace your own humanity, you have an inability at that point to look at another human being and not see their humanity too. If we can remind each other that we're human and reflect our own humanity back to ourselves in each other's eyes. We're going to go a long way towards changing this world and making it the kind of place that it can be. And beautifully said, and I agree. Thank you. You are one of the people doing that better than most. And we thank you so much for joining me today. Sharice, what is next for you? What's, what's, what's next? Um, Where can people find you online as well? So let's see. I'll be going out to LA to, um, I'm going to be shooting a couple of things that um, I'm actually pretty excited about. Um, One is a a live recording. Um, Gordon Campbell has an album, Conversations, Mm -hmm. and he's doing a a live taping. Um, So I'll be there for a couple couple days of that. And then also um, a friend of mine, uh, Malachi Rivers is... Yeah. I know Malachi. Yeah. So, You're going to do unit stills for his, his production. So I'm going to do some portraits for, um, you know, his cast um, for a moment, the and new series that he. Yeah. You know, that's something else we got to add to this conversation. <laughs> and this is beyond artists, beyond photographers. Move through the world with love and integrity because baby, let me tell you, the world is a very small place yeah. and you will leave behind breadcrumbs for people to find who you really are. Like this is another great example of the positive side of that. We both know Malachi. I had no idea you knew Malachi. It makes sense though with the DC connection, but he's a wonderful spirit. But you know, I met man. Malachi in LA. Did you? Because he, uh, a mutual friend brought him to my exhibit and we met, he, so I took him through the exhibit. And so I was telling him some of the stories, you know, behind the scenes of, you know, that particular moment in those images. And then it was around the time I was out there doing like, it was like 4th of July Mm -hmm. um, because my exhibit was out there in the summer. And uh, he was like, well, what are you doing 4th of July? I was like, I don't really have any plans. I'm having a cookout. Come on over. So I went to his house. Like I had just met him at the exhibit and I went to his house and met a bunch of people there. And 
uh, we just stayed in touch, you know, from there. Cause I, I didn't even know, I found out he was from DC when I went over to his house and we're, you know, we're talking and it was like, Oh, you're from DC. Nah. But yeah, I had no idea. I was just like, you know, it's sometimes when you, well, a lot of times I'll say, I'm not going to say sometimes, but when you meet people and you just feel like this kind of genuine spirit about them, you know, it's something that, you know, you feel like, okay, we need to connect yeah. and we're going to connect. And Malachi is, is one of those people where I knew like it within the first meeting, like, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to connect. It's called Leo energy. No, I'm just kidding. Leo <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's a wonderful uh, poet, actor, writer, yeah. all the things. Um, well, Cerise May, it was great speaking with you and spending some time with you. Where can people find you online? So um, my social media is pretty easy. It's my first and last name, uh, Sharice May, um, C-H-E-R-I-S-S-M-A-Y. And that's that's pretty much everywhere. If you just look that up, <laughs> you can find me there. And we're going to put it in the show notes for everybody okay, to make it easy okay. for them. So yeah, Sharice May. Like real simple. Sister, we appreciate you. We appreciate the I work appreciate you're you. doing. Keep doing what you're doing. And thank you so yeah. much for joining us today. And I, I would say the same, you know, Ricky, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for this beautiful conversation, but also keep doing what you're doing because, you know, you're doing critical work and you're, you're doing those things that we need. Um, we need you. We need your voice. We need, you know, who you are. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. I received that and I appreciate it. Thank you. And one last thing I will say is to everybody who's watching and listening, the same is true for you. We need each and every one of you to show up in this world as who you were created to be, not who somebody else imagines you to be, not who the world wants you to be, not who other people p picture you to be, not who you think somebody else wants you to be, not even your version of somebody else. Show up as who you were created to be. Live the life you were created to live because you wouldn't be alive if you weren't coming with gifts that the world needs. And so we are counting on you to show up as you and to give us what you brought into this world with you. Have a good day. Sharice May, thank you for joining us. Take care. Thank you. And tell your story, people. Tell your story. Tell your stories. <laughs>